Do you remember this? Or this? Adelaide are through to the grand final. How about this? Well, he did. He shoved them off his chair, didn't he? John Cosmino off your... Well, I do, and I loved every minute of it. So much so that I decided to write a book about Adelaide United, a club that has done so much in its first 10 years. My name is Lucas Fonten. I've tracked down all the coaches, players and supporters who were there during the important times and they're going to share their memories with you. Over the last 18 months, I've gathered a large collection of photos and stats that will help jog your memory too. But to get this book into print, I need your help. I need around $15,000, which will help cover the costs of editing, graphic layout and printing. If you choose to help, there are a bunch of decent rewards on offer, including copies of the book and invites to the book launch. If any A-League club has a story worth telling, Adelaide United is it. Help me share that story. G'day guys and welcome to the Pure Red Reds Adelaide United Fan TV. I'm your host Ellis Gelios and today is a very special day for the channel because we have in the studio with us Lucas Fonten, former ABC journalist, currently uh, working for the Port Adelaide Power in the AFL and uh, the author of A Decade United, uh, the Bible of Adelaide United as I refer to it. Lucas, it is amazing to get you in here. Thanks so much for, for uh, coming in. Uh, it's great to be here. Tell us uh, how you've seen the season unfold so far as a fan. Yeah, um, firstly, thanks for calling it the Bible. I don't know if it's quite that, but that's okay. That's Look, exactly what it is. <laughs> uh, well, it, it hasn't been, um, I guess, a smooth season by any accounts. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, in terms of, you know, there's been so many injuries. There was a, the, the talk, obviously, about, you know, lack of that forward option and not having a, a dedicated striker up there. Yep. But seemingly, they were almost getting better results with... Um, you know, Ben Halloran and playing like a really mobile front three. So um, the trick is now, is the, and the test will be now that there are a few more injuries in terms of those fast players that we relied upon so much, um, how are they going to respond? The good thing is there's still a few games till finals. Mm -hmm. the, the Reds still pretty much assured a, a final spot and it's just a matter of consolidating that top four. And I guess if they can just... You know, get a few, even if it's a Dow draw or a couple of, um, you know, one, one points, so it's just yeah. points. Just keep adding points, keep the distance, keep the break on the bottom six and, and try to you know, hold on to that top four spot. You know, who knows what will happen in finals if some of these players come back fit and firing. For sure. Uh, we're going to talk about the book in a second, but I'm just going to start by taking you all the way back to the start of your professional journey, I guess, if you'd like to sure. call it that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, I've written that you're probably Adelaide United's best known fan that's worked in the media but never for the club in an official capacity. Um, so tell us about your earliest memories supporting the club and whether you envisioned uh, that the profile of the club would reach the point that it's at today. Yeah, um, I guess I can clear something up there. I kind of did work for the club in a, as a volunteer yeah, while okay. I was still in, uh, studying at uni. It was a, one of these sort of media coordinator volunteer jobs sure. where it was, you know, making sure photographers were in the right place. So it was like a work experience kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. pretty much, yeah. yeah. It was just, a, you know, whenever there was a home game, mm -hmm. it was three, about three or four hours of, you know, being there to help out. But That's awesome. It was a good grounding on what was involved in terms of um, the media side of the professional sporting world. So, uh, you know, I, I have to say that that was uh, really good for me, but um, sort of went in a completely different direction after that professionally. In terms of supporting the club, though, um, I remember being there at that first game and the, the excitement around the build-up. I, I didn't really know what to expect, um, and it was huge. Uh, I found myself, I think, given I think at the time I might have been in year eleven, yeah. ten or year eleven, and um, it was sort of for me it was that time when suddenly you know I had my peas, I could drive, I had the, the freedom to go to games when I wanted to because home much isn't always the easiest place to get to, and when you're a uh, you know, a young kid or a, you know, early teens without your license trying to get around the place yeah. is a bit tricky. So um, finally I had the freedom to go when I wanted to and watch all the games, whereas I found myself in the NSL days having to, you know, listen to a lot of games on the radio or yeah, yeah. whatever when I couldn't go. So the old, the good old days. Yeah, so I sort of, yeah, yeah I, grew, I grew up with the club, mm -hmm. I feel. Um, I think that's why I was so passionate about it was that, you know, I felt like I, I know the beginning of it, I've seen it all, I've been there along the journey with them and 
and that was important for me and, you know covering the book was to put that passion into the book as well absolutely i did ask dom ronaldo um whether he thought that after the uh the first ever game against brisbane strikers that um you know we'd go on and do what we did in the asian champions league and um you know everything that Leeds united has achieved since uh being in the nso in that last season um do you remember what was going through your mind sitting in the ground on that night because um you know the story goes i was, I was quite young myself so i don't remember a whole lot but the story goes that um you know people were struggling to get in they hadn't anticipated that there'd be such a large volume of fans all trying to get in so near to kick off um there were dramas going on outside the ground obviously it was a sellout um did you think that this was like just a sugar hit or for the state or did you think that adelaide united uh were going to go on and do the things they've done i'm i'm a pretty optimistic bloke and yeah uh you know i i found myself sitting behind the goals on the uh, southern end i guess it is um and I was up on the staircase because there was nowhere to sit. There was barely standing room and I, I'm not the tallest guy, so trying to yeah. see other people wasn't gonna happen. So the staircase was my spot and I, and I didn't care. And I was, you know, just pulled along by the rush and I just thought, this is it. You know, this, That's amazing. this is a huge change. This is amazing. Um, everyone's behind this. And um, I felt like, yeah, there was, you know, there were periods where I, I guess the honeymoon feeling washed off, but yeah. um, I don't know, for the most part, I feel like yeah, Adelaide United has been just a breath of fresh air and um, I think we're all behind him for the most part, especially at the moment. I think you might have been made for you, mate, because you were, if you tell me you were sitting in the southern stand, you were, uh, you had the perfect view of um, the goal, first ever. That's right. So, um, absolutely incredible. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's just, it's just great. I, I love going back and speaking to people that have a real fresh um, take on what happened on that night because, um, you know, it was a long time ago and, uh, I feel like a lot of people back then, um, you know, probably a lot of them might have corporate tickets and so you just don't find that many people. There's a, there's a few Red Army people that you run into that have memories of the earliest ever days, but yeah. I feel like uh, people in your category are a bit of a red read, you know, ha having such a um, fresh memory of what went on, on on that night and still to that uh, to this day have followed passionately and never missed a game you know and and so uh, it is very fitting that we get you on the show um, just moving right along so you began working for the ABC in Adelaide in 2008 uh, while working in the industry um, did you see me interest in Adelaide United and the A-League as a whole continue to rise from the first A-League season onwards um, just having an outside perspective um, in the initial stages, yes, by the time, so I started working part-time at the ABC in um, 2006 and um, there wasn't like a huge amount of interest if it was a, a decision between, you know, a football press conference or a soccer press conference, they would always pick the football one, sure. regardless of the fact it was pre-season and, you know, the A-League was heading towards finals, you know, mm -hmm. the real business end, so yeah. there, there was a lot of frustration for me, um, so there, were, there became, we got to a point where um, I heard that the Newcastle ABC station was going to broadcast the A-League games okay. and that Melbourne was looking into it as well. And so I contacted the, uh, the local people who run ABC Grandstand, yeah. that's the sporting sort of arm of, of the ABC. And I said, well, why, why aren't we doing this? Hmm. It's not that hard. You easily do it over the summer. It's not going to conflict with too many cricket yeah. or other, other sports. And um, it's a popular game. And it needs to be done. The, the rights are there. Let's let's have a crack. And I sort of waited while I didn't hear anything. And then eventually, I just got this email back saying, "Well, um, if you're so keen to do it, why don't you come help us out? Sounds like we're going to cover a few of the games and see what okay. happens." So that was in incredible for me because yeah. suddenly I was, you know, involved in the coverage and I was learning from some fantastic commentators. And um, so I'm pretty grateful for that. But to this day, you know, it hasn't, hasn't stopped. Yeah. I've, left the, I've left the ABC, but I'm still working for the ABC in that mm. capacity. Um, but in terms of, yeah, the media coverage, well, I think in terms of uh, the, the print side of things, it's been good, strong yeah. and steady, and I've, I've really appreciated that, um, that some of the, the older heads, I guess, from the NSL days, the, the Michael Lynches and mm -hmm. guys like that who've been around are still there, but there's been a, a good young new breed that have come through, and for sure. There's shows like this, um, there's, podcasts everywhere um, there's a lot of critical evaluation of teams and um, I think the game is matured now to a point in Australia where mm. we're accepting of that 
that's something Ange Postacoglu, Postacoglu I think brought up uh, during his Socceroos a tenure that we have to be able to be critical now and accept some of that stuff so um, it's great I think the sport's getting to a point now that yeah it is maturing and the media coverage is maturing for mine it's still not enough yep but it's a start um, and yeah I think the point the problem is that maybe the power brokers within the media industry don't necessarily um, accept the game I'll give you a quick example driving in there was a, a radio interview just now um, with Ryan Kiddo okay and they asked two questions about Adelaide United season they spent the rest of the interview asking about um, you know players being able to kick with their left and right foot okay and saying you know where do you learn that and, and how do you know which position you're going to play and does the coach decide or is it something you want to do and just such basic questions that I just think oh. you know it doesn't matter what sport you play it's the same kind of thing you know yeah, and I think yes, why yeah. asking these stupid yeah. questions so yeah there's still um, a football dominance mm -hmm. AFL football dominance sure. in this world um, and it sat, must sound strange for someone who works for a <laughs> football club but um, my heart is still firmly with yeah. with uh, the Ramble game it's, it's um, what I grew up with and I still feel passionately about so I was I thought well if I'm so passionate about it why don't I do something about it? Yeah. And like yourself, I, I got involved and I did what I wanted to do and needed to do. For sure. Um, I just want to quickly ask, um, as you might have been during that time, early uh, early days of the ABC where they were considering the radio coverage, um, because you obviously, um, you know, tried to get the ball rolling yourself, um, having been a bit of a novice back then, were you a little bit daunted when it all came back to you so quickly or were you just... Were you just raring to go and willing to do whatever you could to try and get something going? Yeah, look, I, I think I had that youthful confidence. Yeah. I just expected that, oh, no, I'll be fine. Yeah, I can talk about the game. I know the team. Yeah. It's easy. Uh, yeah, it's not as easy as you think. But yeah, for sure. um, as I said, I was really fortunate to have a couple of um, great guys, uh, um, Roger Wills and um, a few other guys around the place that just sort of gave me some really great... Um, and Peter Walsh was another one as well, and they just gave me some real great insight into what the important things are in commentary sure. to keep in mind. And so that was something that I, yeah, I made sure I, I kept in my mind all the time. And yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's great to have that youthful confidence. Maybe now it would have been a different story if they just said, yeah, we'll throw you in. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm so grateful that they, they keep me. No, that's awesome. <laughs> um, I guess we've sort of already touched on this a little bit, but um, you may want to expand on it a little bit. Um, I just want to ask you, so being involved in the ABC Grandstand coverage, um, dream come true to have this gig? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's, um, I, I always thought I'd be like a print like journalist. That was something I decided when I was about 12 or 13, but um, I don't know, I just sort of fell into a job at the ABC in uni and then kind of fell into that role with ABC Grandstand. So. Yeah. Um, and suddenly you get your first taste of this live coverage and um, you feel the atmosphere of the crowd. Like I, I never sit with both headphones on or if I, if I can help it because you can't hear the crowd properly. Yeah, you, yeah. you don't feel that emotion and that spark and um, there's something to be said for how you describe a game because radio is so different to say TV where mm. you see things. Um, we, you know, we have to describe what's going on, where, exactly. the, where the listeners are. Yeah. And so if you can describe what you're seeing as well as what you're feeling, um, that, that takes you know, the listeners somewhere else. So yeah, I'm always listening to the crowd and, and um, yeah, the, the tricky thing is that, um, I think the ABC got that into me, is being unbiased as much as possible. Right. Um, I'm currently working a bit with Damien Mori, who's doing a lot of our special comments. Okay. And a couple of weeks ago, we had a bit of a, and it's, it's a bit silly, but we had a bit of a malfunction where suddenly we couldn't go to air. Um, one of the cables wasn't working and we couldn't do anything. So. We basically sat and watched the game together and we had a bit of a chat about things and I said to him, look, you know, he's only just started this season. Yeah. And I said, I probably have no place in saying this. I said, you're offering us such great insight to the coaching and what, you know, is going on. You see the game so well. The problem is you're, you're often referring too much to Adelaide United. Yeah, okay. And I said, you've got to remember that a lot of the people, you know, who are listening yeah. are from, you know, whichever other team they're playing. So yeah. you need to give a balanced view and... Um, so it's not only you know Adelaide needs to find a goal to, to get back in this game. It's it's you know the Mariners need to yeah, yeah. to hold the Mariners defence you know to make sure they can hold on to the three points. So um, he's taken that on board, and it's something that I learned pretty early as well. That as much as you know you want to be wearing your red shirt yeah. underneath, 
Um, you can't do it. You know, I, I went to the Asian Cup when it was on here in Australia, and Australia ended up winning, and I was at the first game, and I was at the last game, and I was sitting in the press box, and I had my Socceroo shirt on. Wow, while you were working. But I put a jacket over the top. <laughs> it was probably a bit unprofessional, yeah. but you can't help what the heart yeah, wants, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Uh, yeah, you have to let the head override it just for a little bit. That's fascinating because, I mean, firstly, um, David Murray of all people, you'd assume probably isn't coming from an Adelaide United perspective, mm. having never played for Adelaide United. Correct. Famously rejecting Adelaide United yeah. every option you had. Um, and secondly, um, you know, it's something that I get caught up in myself a lot as well. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's important that we all remember that. Um, you know, there is ethics to, to what we do and mm. um, people do want to see unbiased opinions and right. I've seen people uh, within Red Army forums say, um, you know, I really appreciated this that someone else has done or whatever it's been, um, just underlining how how um, how much they appreciate it when people aren't sort of coming from a supporter perspective. Yeah. Um, so it is really interesting that you bring that up. Um, anyhow, we'll press right along. So. During early 2013, I understand you sat in on the courtroom proceedings involving former United manager Rooney Cullen and former owner of the club Greg Griffin after the Dutchman endeavoured to sue the ownership of the club over the circumstances surrounding his dismissal. Um, and that was all the way back in 2011. Can you shed some light on what went down during the case as during the time um, I feel like uh, it kind of, it was big news when it first happened when he got sacked and then the, the whole litigation process just took obviously a while like it does. Um, and by that time, people just weren't in the loop anymore. You, however, obviously had your ear on the ground and uh, you were close to the events that were unfolding um, in the courtroom. Um, so tell us what that was like. We know eventually that, um, according to the advertiser, um, Rennie Cullen was paid for $100,000. I believe that was through a mediation process in the end. I'm not 100% yeah, yeah. sure what went down, but yeah, it was a straight. It really was a strange um, sort of case. Yeah, it's something I've, I've never been one of those guys known for breaking stories mm. and that kind of thing. So this for me it was great because yeah, there was some talk that there was going to be a, a lawsuit or that you know it, Coolin was weighing up his legal options, yep. which I sort of personal opinion was that he probably had a leg to stand on yep. there um, as an amateur lawyer, having been in the courtroom for five <laughs> years, but. Um, yeah, I was driving home one day and I, I was thinking about that, reading that there could be legal sort of ramifications there and I thought, maybe I should just check with the courts every now and then just to see if any documents have been filed, if they've yeah. been lodged, because it'd be interesting to read them. And um, most of these documents are publicly accessible mm -hmm. if you have the right permissions and you, you fill out the right forms. So yeah, one night I was uh, driving home and I, I rang the court just before it closed and I said, um, I just want to check, is there any documents in the name of Coolin versus Adelaide United? And they, you know, hear them tapping around the keyboard and they said, yeah, uh, yep, lodged 15 minutes ago. And I was like, wow, that's so weird. It's, you know, my first call and yeah. I just had this feeling I should call and that was it. So on a platter for you. On a platter. So I raced in, filled out the forms and I had about 15 minutes to read them and that's um, awesome. take a bunch of notes. So yeah, I got to sort of actually break the news that it was happening. Um, and then I guess... It, it combined a couple of my passions, which was the law and the rent. Yeah. <laughs> so I was a very, very interested in onlooker in those proceedings, but it was a really, really strange case, the way that it played out. And I couldn't see for the life of me why either side was letting it go the way they were. Okay. Especially the club, because the more like Coolin gave evidence and others gave evidence and more documents were filed, it seemed to be just such a strong case. And I thought this is only going one way and I thought, you know, my personal view was that Coolin wanted his day in court, he wanted to tell his side mm -hmm. of the story, it, that was important to him. Um, the club was never going to win, um, so in the end they both kind of, you know, settled their differences and obviously, saved a lot but of it was, money. yeah, I mean yeah. It, it cost a lot of money but it yeah. probably saved a bit in the end as well. Um, as I said, I think it was important for Rini to say, to tell his story and afterwards he sort of let us come up to his apartment and uh, do a little interview to sort of tell okay. his story a little bit there. So um, that was good. But I mean, he wasn't, he, he didn't want to, you know, bad mouth the club or anything yeah. like that. He just didn't like the way he, he was handled. I guess he was a, you know, he's a professional coach. He knows what happens in the coaching game. Yeah, for sure. Um, you're in it for a, a short and a good time, not, mm. not a long time. So um, he knew the way it sort of played out. It wasn't great, but he knew that it was a chance to happen. So 
yeah, just a really strange case, but um, it was intriguing for me at the time. In your opinion, has the club probably, I mean, was it a learning curve for Adelaide United having signed Rooney Cool into such a big contract uh, less than 12 months before he was dismissed? Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Um, don't think we've seen too many long-term contracts yeah. uh, for now, and I think as much as it's, um, it's the way that is often done in Europe, mm -hmm. um, and there's big out clauses, there's big you know, payouts because Look at Manchester United, but they just yeah, with those Euros in it. Yeah, it's um, it's it's not ideal. Mm. But the, I guess the A-League clubs need to realise they don't have the kind of money that those you know EPL clubs and the, the sure. European ones do. So they can't afford that. Um, the English Premier League clubs and those big you know European clubs they they sign those big long term contracts mm. because that's the only way to, to keep those people who are in demand. Now I don't know how in demand Rooney Coolen was, but. Um, yeah, the, you know, the team playing some good football, but mm. I don't know that he was um, getting fielding offers left, right and centre. Yeah. Um, it so also wasn't his squad exactly in which right. we had performed so well the prior, prior season. So yeah. I don't know whether so that was taken into account. Very like true. it should have been. Yeah. yeah, so I don't know, but yeah, definitely a, a learning, a lesson there for the club. And, and um, I'm sure, as I said, not going to see too many long term, you know, the, maybe three yeah. years might be the absolute maximum for a coach. Yeah, real interesting. Um, so we're going to move it right along to what everyone wants to hear about. So uh, Lucas, 2015, this little baby here is released. Um, we're just going to talk about a whole bunch of different things. <laughs> so um, first of all, so obviously 2015, you authored and released what I previously mentioned uh, that I like to refer to as being the Bible of Adelaide United. The book A Decade United. I've got a few questions I'll ask you Go about it. the entire process from yeah. uh, when you first penned the first paragraph to uh, eventually getting this book published. Um, first of all, what inspired you to undertake this project, knowing that its ceiling virtually went no further than a modest supporter base of a non-Eastern State sporting club? And I just want to clarify what I mean by that. Mm. In terms of um, you know how hard it is to author and self-publish. And then knowing that um, it can only really, in terms of sales, go so far because yeah. realistically, people outside of Adelaide aren't going to buy this book. Yeah, we're not making um, mega bucks out of it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> of course. Um, yeah. So yeah, just tell us, um, yeah. uh, you know, what what the main inspiration was having that in mind, obviously. Yeah, um, it was more a passion project. Yeah. I, I found myself a little bit bored with work. Mm -hmm. um, I had a few friends who traveled overseas at the time and was sending me all these annoying photos and making me really jealous and I was just looking for something else um, just to challenge me a bit more so yeah I, I'm the kind of person that loves being busy mm -hmm. um, it's exhausting but I love it so yeah I, I thought well what's what's coming up now how can I keep my you know my place in the game and keep writing you know doing stuff with the sport yep. um, I was sitting in a you know, a court office mm. writing stories about all this death it must get a bit yeah. yeah and I hate to say it, I was getting a little bit cold to some of the human emotions that you know people people go through in yeah, all these yeah. court things yeah. so it, was, it wasn't great um, but um, I thought I need something to refresh myself so I thought well why not challenge myself and write a book mm. and a lot of people were saying oh don't do it or you're never going to do that it's a big yeah. task but I thought it was coming up to the 10 year anniversary of the club and I thought, well, it's only 10 years, but so much has happened. Um, yeah, the club was in the news a lot and um, there were just so many great little stories to tell along the mm -hmm. way. And I thought, well, why not? Why not? It'd be great timing. The club might actually enjoy it. They might like it. They might get on board as well and help me um, you know, push it and it might benefit them as well. So after all, I, 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 don't, <laughs> I, I don't want to... Um uh, you know, speak on behalf of what the club might have been thinking at the time. But mm. from my perspective, I almost feel like uh, it's a lot of free press. Um, not all of it is positive, but at the end of the day, they, they say that any news is good news. So, yeah. um, you know, uh, was that something you obviously had in mind, thinking, mm. um, you know, why wouldn't a club that um, doesn't really have a whole lot of press that's uh, not associated to Fox Sports and certainly in, in terms of a book, um, you know, why wouldn't they want to try and help me out as best as they can? That's, yeah, that's exactly right. I, I just, um, I thought at the time that, again, the game was still evolving, it was still maturing a little bit here and I, I just thought, I don't know that any sort of form of book like this had been done yeah. about any club in the league. Um, Adelaide was sort of one of those ones with Perth Glory that really 
change the outlook on the game and you know when the out league came about yep. they were just there so they were, they were brilliant already so, yeah. yeah I thought there were so many great stories and, and why wouldn't the club want to tell them um, there's also I don't know, there was a lot of negative stories there was some stuff that you know they probably didn't like but the way I approach life is that yeah you have your good times and your bad and all of that own your history yeah you got to own it you got to, that's, that's what makes yeah. you up yeah. whether you're a club or an individual that's that's who you are. Mm-hmm. Um, embrace it. You know, you look back fondly on some things and not so fondly on others, but all of them help shape you. So, for me, that was important to put those things in the book. Sure. Um, the club, maybe you know, because it, I guess it was an unofficial thing. I had mm-hmm. sort of initially spoken to a few people at the club saying that I'm thinking of doing this. Mm-hmm. You guys are interested in helping in any way? Do you want to, you know, do you want to be involved? And the talks, I don't know if they went too far. Sort of left it up to them and. A few people left the club then. You spoke of Don yeah. Ronaldo. Um, there was another guy, Nick Kerber, who was a yeah. year guy. No, of Nick, yeah. Yeah, uh, Glenn Elliott was there as um, CEO at the time and a few others. And yeah, you know, people come and go and mm. some ideas change and positions yeah, yeah, change. Yeah, for sure. I know how you feel. Never quite got there, yeah. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. Um, so, uh, at what point did it become clear to you that you were going to have to pursue a crowdfunding model to get this book published? Because, um, you know, if this book has a profound legacy, it's the fact that you did everything. Um, uh, so, talk us through uh, what kind of ordeal this was. Um, it's a massive step to take, particularly as, as someone that hasn't been an author before. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you know, how were you feeling and, and were you confident that um, this drive for um, outside help from supporters was, was going to ever take off, let alone mm-hmm. um, succeed in the manner that it did. I, again, again, that youthful confidence was there. I approached it full of confidence that this was going to work. Yeah. That I thought, at the time, there was about 9,000 members, and I thought, you know, a dollar two dollars from each of those, and I'm there. Um, and it, it became really apparent to me that I was going to need some other sort of financial backing because... Yeah. You know, I was a lowly journal, not getting a lot of money. Not, <laughs> yeah. I didn't, didn't um, have the means to really part ways with 30 grand. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it was it was tricky, but I, I approached a couple of publishers about it. Um, you know, submitted manuscripts. They wanted, you know, four or five chapters to send to them. And I don't think they quite understood what I was visualizing, which was, you know, a real um, pictorial book with yeah. um, the narrative in the background and um, let the characters, you know, the, the people who were there, let them tell the story. Sure. Um, so I don't know that they quite understood it, um, and I I was very lucky to have a, a guy who I, I rate highly as a mentor um, at the ABC, Mike Sexton, um, who had written a bunch of books previously, right, um, particularly about sport. And he said to me, "Why don't Why don't you crap? Well, not crap. I mean, he said, "Why don't you self publish?" I said to him, "Yeah, but how expensive is that?" Mm. And he said, "Well, I've been able to publish some books for like nine dollars a book." Okay. So it's not too bad, depending how many copies you want to do, how many photos, that kind of thing, and how high quality. Now I didn't want to, I didn't want to do a, excuse my language, but I didn't want to do it like a crappy quality book. Yeah, I wanted to, course. to do as good as I possibly yeah, could. Yeah, this yeah. was something that you know. I was You're like, leaving your footprint. That's right. I was yeah. putting two years of my life into yeah. it. So, um, I, I started to do the sums and, I. I I researched it so heavily. Mm. Um, I had some really great people support me. So when you say I did it by myself, it didn't really because I had, um, I, I had you know a great graphic designer, yeah. um, uh, someone who was going to do all the you know the, the checking all the copies. She was an editor yeah. for me, and um, I had you know people helping with photos and all sorts of stuff. So I was really his, his name that. escapes me, but he's Adam uh, Butler. Adam Butler, yeah, so, is a veteran. Yeah, so I should name him. Paul, Paul Charles was yeah. a guy who was playing with me at Adelaide Vipers, um, playing soccer, and he just happened to be a graphic designer, and I didn't know much about the guy at the time, but yeah. he told me he was good, so he um, he jumped on board, and I don't think he realised how big the job was. Yeah, for sure. And nor did um, Margaret Bowden, who became my editor, and I just literally found her, uh, there's a site for experts, and I found her as a, someone who was good at editing, and she would edit mainly people's PhDs. Okay. But she put down her areas of expertise as sport, women's sport, um, soccer, Australian soccer. And so there were some and good thought, red flags. Yeah, there's some big flags there for yeah. me. So yeah. um, I, I contacted her and it turned out that, you know, she was doing a radio program with, um, you know, Donald Campbell was a you know, yeah. fantastic man. And, um, they had a great friendship. So she knew the stuff. She went to all the Adelaide games. She was right across the content and she was excited to 
read what I'd done. Mm-hmm. Problem was, she didn't realise how many words it was going to be. Yeah, and that kind yeah, of yeah. Stuff. So, yeah. But long story short, it, it, it once I had spoken in particular with um, Paul, a graphic designer, who he'd, he'd put together a bunch of like school yearbooks. Okay. Um, so this kind of was based similar to, to one of those in terms of layout and stuff, and mm-hmm. we. Um, pretty quickly realised that it was going to be pretty costly and okay. um, that yeah, there was no way we could do it alone. So crowdfunding was something that was kind of a last resort after approaching a bunch of different local businesses, uh, people who sponsored the club I thought might try. Um, and in the end, yeah, we did it. Um, but geez, there were some hairy moments there where you know, <laughs> we're in the last three or four days of the campaign. And, and you lose everything for those that don't understand. Yeah. That's how it works, isn't it? Yeah, it was through Possible. So yeah. they're... they're mechanism was that yeah you, you set a goal and, a, and a, a deadline and if you don't achieve it then all the money goes back to the well it doesn't get collected from the people so you get none of it so um these days there's a few different ones that don't do that mm-hmm. which may have been a smarter move on my part but again i told you i like the challenge yeah for sure so um i just recall a quick story where i i was actually driving to melbourne i bought a new car and i need to get the k's up I went to visit some family in melbourne and it just happened to be three days before the deadline for the book, uh, for the crowdfunding. Yeah. So I'd done all this research saying that, you know, you need a set to be like a 30 day or a, or a 60 day max for crowdfunding. The longer you leave it, the more people forget and get bored. Okay. You need to hammer people on social media. You need to do all sorts of stuff, give them great prizes and things. And so I started to, I thought I'd done it all right, but three days out and I still needed something like five and a half thousand. And I thought this isn't going to happen. Yeah. This is not going to happen. And I've been to all these businesses and made deals and said, oh, you put some in and this and that. And it just wasn't happening. So, um, but suddenly, I don't know, I stopped somewhere. We're in Mount Gambier, actually. We stopped for the night there and I made a couple more phone calls, almost pleading with people to get on board because mm-hmm. I thought, this is this is not going to happen now. Do this, what yeah. do I do? Yeah. And suddenly I just got, I think I got like two fairly big cash injections of like one might have been about a thousand bucks. One might have been four, four fifty or something like that. And I think people suddenly realised that, hey, we can make this happen. Yeah, and it was yeah. people power more yeah. than me. I put a couple of posts on social media and probably really piss people off a little bit because it gets a bit annoying. Yeah. Self promotion. Yeah. But um, I don't know, a couple of guys I knew that I'd played with at different soccer clubs, Northern Demons in particular, up in Port Perry, they they right. jumped in and then a few other people I didn't even know were saying, Hey guys, get around this. You know, we only need another Two and a half thousand. Mm-hmm. Really need another, you know, fifteen hundred dollars, and yeah. So when we sort of made it, about I got to Melbourne, and I think we had about eight hours left or something, and we suddenly got there, and I was just like, oh my god! Like, yeah. Not only was I exhausted from driving, but I was yeah. just emotionally drained. Emotionally yeah. drained. <laughs> so spent by yeah. it. But it just it gave me that extra incentive to push on with the project, get it, you know, get it done, and do a really good job of it because I felt like these people were now like relying on me. Mm. Well, uh, we are forever indebted to you for going through that, mate. Um, very inspirational to, to hear that you uh, had the extra reserves in you mm-hmm. to make sure that this wasn't going to um, continue to be a pipe dream and that you were going to get there in the end. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's amazing to just hear you talk about the entire process. I just want to quickly ask, um, when did the idea first come about to do this? Was it around 2012-ish or? Yeah, it might have been towards the end of 2012. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it just took a, a long time to really get the ball rolling. Like once sure. I had the idea, I thought, yeah, I should do it. But um, I didn't really race towards it. Okay. And then suddenly, yeah, through some boredom, I just went, well, maybe I'll do some research and start, you know, planning things. And suddenly I was printing out reams and reams of stuff and putting them in folders and in you know, order of you know, the, the time frames and breaking things down and thinking about what, what are the key stories? What are the key things? I was getting really excited. Sure. You hit the wall when suddenly you realise all I've done is research. I haven't written anything. Yeah, there's nothing on paper. Yet. It's a massive task. So, yeah, I sort of stopped. I would do I would do three or four years at a time of research. Yeah. And then I would go and write stuff because suddenly when you start to see it on the paper, it's more and more it's real. splurges out. It's real. Yeah, yeah, it just keeps coming. And I thought yeah. I'm just gonna lay it all out there. Keep writing. I'm gonna keep calling people and meeting up with them. Um, and I, <laughs> it's pretty, it's a bit silly. Like I. I met with Ross Alawisi and I had to go out to his work and you know I was driving after hours. Yeah, yeah. I'd go before workplaces and after work and weekends and everywhere every spare minute and yeah, you know, I met up with Ross Alawisi at his work and I almost almost made him cry almost. He's a tough nut, but he uh 
just recalling the story of you know getting sent off yeah. in the grand final sure. and he was just trying to drive the club and sort of knowing in the end that it was his sort of last game the way that things went and yeah yeah he sort of really delved back into the memory bank and it was like i wasn't even there the way he sort of described it so it was stuff like that though for me as a fanboy yeah, yeah it was great yeah, because yeah. i was hearing things i didn't know yeah and that was key for me in this book was absolutely if i didn't know it as someone who'd been there the whole way and mm. kept an eye on everything you know suddenly that had to be there it was it was those oh really moments yeah as soon as i had an oh really moment bang in the book write that down highlight it put it wow. down. yeah I, I can really relate to that yeah um just describe us describe for us what it was like um seeing a microsoft word document turn into this was it <laughs> Was yeah. it euphoric? Was it relieving? How were you feeling? What was the state of mind like? I was, I was getting a bunch of layouts sent to me, like yeah. PDF files, and I, going, oh, I don't know if that's quite what I was thinking. No, that's not quite right. But the the day that I got, we got sent like a trial version of this, mm -hmm. like a, a mocked up version, and we sort of only had the layout done for about a quarter of it. Okay. But just to see that on paper was, mm -hmm. oh, it was yeah, it's pretty emotional. I think the only thing that eclipsed that was when I finally got the first box of books. Okay, yeah. And that was for two reasons. Number one, because we'd had a massive hold up uh, with Chinese customs, with all sorts of things. There was a big storm off Sydney. I had the book launch all booked and paid for. Um, I thought I'd give myself plenty of time and mm. suddenly these books had taken, you know, three or four weeks longer to get to me than they should have. Far out. And I did a big ring around. I got, I called, like my, the, the publisher had gone on holiday and shut down and I, what am I gonna do? So in the end, um, I called directly. I found a receipt they'd sent me with the invoice on it and it had a, a Chinese invoice. I rang them directly, the factory, and I said, any chance that you have at least one book lying around that I can have for this book launch to show people? And they said, we've got 21 of them, um, but we love it. We want to keep some because we yeah. want to show people. And this was me. I said, I, rang, I spoke to eight people on the phone because do you speak any English? No, someone else. Did any English? No. Eventually I got someone. And she said, look, I don't really get a lot of what you're saying. Mm. Can you put it in an email so I can at least translate it? Wow, okay. So 21 books, um, yeah. they wanted to keep, you know, five of them. They sent me two boxes. I had to pay extra career fees and <laughs> get it here. God, and I, well. <laughs> it came, you know, I think it was two days before I got them. And that, the relief was one thing. But to open it up, it's funny. One of the, my colleagues, I didn't know, but he took couple of photos of me yeah and it was like I was holding my first child the way I was you know I was really I was looking That's at this thing and I, I had like almost a little tear in my eyes yeah just to, well, to we see can't blame for that yeah so yeah I mean seeing it start to come together yeah. it was crazy it was all those you know countless hours of spent at poor old Paul's house and chasing him and yeah. photos and stuff but yeah it was um it was an incredible feeling oh that's amazing um I guess you've touched on uh, most of the people that helped you along the way, so I'm going to ask you now a bit of an out there kind of question, but what would you tell a fan that has a journalistic appetite um, who tries to emulate your work in 2030 or beyond? Um, make sure you really want to do it. Okay. <laughs> first, first thing first. Sound make sure advice. you really want to do it because if you don't, there's no, yeah, yeah don't waste your time. Um, there's no turning back once you're, you're yeah. in and, and you started, but... Um, yeah, approach it first as a, a journalist, then as a fan, I guess, is another thing. Um, I talked before about the heart and the head and yeah. the balance. Um, because I wanted this to be for the club, um, not quite the Bible maybe, but I wanted it to be something that people could always refer to. Um, I was particularly passionate and I wanted the, the fan in me to come out a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, keep that in mind, but I guess the other thing is just yeah have the support of the club if possible mm -hmm. <laughs> that would that is a massive help if you can um i guess by the time 2030 or beyond comes around you know things will change again there'll be yeah. you know different ways of publishing things um different photos different things like that um and hopefully by then the club's got its butt into gear in terms of its own history mm -hmm. um they had a history committee for a while which yeah. Adam butler was on yeah um that's kind of disbanded doesn't really is there still the history room, room? Um, from what you know because well, that was a really popular thing when it, it first happened it, it was great wasn't it and those guys did such great work on it mm. now from my understanding a lot of those trophies and mementos have been moved okay um to well they were going to go to elizabeth to yeah. a separate room there that was sort of promised right i haven't kept track on actually what's mm. happening with that but it's such an important thing and what you don't want to be doing is chasing your tails you know 30 40 50 years down the track 
try to find things, yeah. find people. You know, you, to me, history is like right up there with the most important things because you, Absolutely. yeah, you got to be proud of your history and confident of your future, and you need to be able to, you know, rely on the history to, to, to take those lessons and mm-hmm. those learnings and something to be proud of. There's a lot to be proud of, for Adelaide United. And Absolutely, yeah, they should really take your mind of that. Um, now, I don't know how this felt to you, but it almost felt fitting to me, but hindsight is an amazing thing. Yep. So um, basically this book gets released and then uh, within no time, about less than a year after possibly the release or just over a year after, um, Adelaide United finally lift that weight off the shoulder, uh, take out the, the minor premiership mm-hmm. and the championship in the yep. most phenomenal style that uh, we will always uh, remember <laughs> with uh, every edge of our life and, and soul. Um, what, what's it like thinking back to the fact that um, you released this book right on the cusp of arguably, well, not arguably, but definitely the most special period that this club has ever seen itself un- undergo? Yeah, I'll be honest, I was spewing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, I was hoping you wouldn't say that. Because even just as I was going to release it, they won the FFA Cup. Okay, yeah. And it was important for me to include that yeah. in here as well and so there's, there's a fairly brief mention of it mm. in a photo or something like that but um that's only because it was a real last minute addition sure um, yeah i mean where do you stop for me i'd kind of already thought it was the, the first 10 years is what i was marking mm. um it took a lot longer to get together and get the books out than yeah. i would have liked so it kind of came out towards the end of the 11th season I yes think. okay um but i guess I, I needed to include the first 10 seasons so you need to allow yourself, to, you know, the time to add that. So I've kind of had eleven seasons there, but um, or, or eleven years, I guess. Um, so yeah, that was disappointing. But you know, I was just happy that the club had won it. Um, sure. This is why everyone kept. I, I don't know how many message I had of people saying, "Oh, volume two coming out, or the update, yeah. or the edit." Yeah. Um, Asked my wife, but if I, I reckon I've got about. I still probably got about one hundred and twenty copies in yeah. my garage, and. I think if um, if you asked her, she'd be like, "No, nah, not to get rid of those. You are not yeah. writing anymore." So yeah. um, there was there was a, a fleeting moment of inspiration where I considered it. Um, I considered doing one about all of um, Australian football. Yeah. Okay. But uh, yeah, it's so much work. And as I said, if you're not completely dedicated to it, you can't do it. So I, I sort of let that one slide, and I thought maybe the next person will write it. Mm-hmm. Um, there was actually going to be a book about it. Someone approached me and said, can we get some advice and some help? Wow. Because I said, I was thinking of just writing yeah. something about it, um, a, a shorter book purely mm-hmm. based around that season. Or, um, but yeah, a couple of guys approached me and I was happy to help and I met with them and did all sorts of things. And I said to them, look, if you're not going to do it, I wanted to do it, but out of respect because you approached me and you seem to be a bit further along than I was, I'm going to leave you to do it. Yeah. And it was, yeah, it's disappointing that it never happened because, yeah. um, I don't know whether I would have done a better job or not, but I at least would have done it. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I do just tend to ask every guest I get on <laughs> um, about what their experience was like during that title winning season and, and just being on the ride when, uh, you know, we, we went through so much and it all, just, it all just came up for us in the end after so many years of pain <laughs> and heartbreak, which... Um, it was all documented right in that baby <laughs> right. there. Um, yeah. Now, I just want you to quickly tell our viewers uh, what you've been up to since releasing A Decade of United yep. um, and how closely you still support or have any sort of involvement with the club. Well, uh, I guess in the initial stages, there was a lot of like promoting as much as I could the book. Yeah. Um, did a little book launch and um, we, yeah, did some radio stuff and mm-hmm. whatever we could just to get it out. But. Um, Beyond that, yeah, I, I continued on working with the ABC, um, still mainly doing court reporting, but I, I then I shifted to Sydney for a while yeah. um, as a sport reporter, um, came back because I, I just, I liked it, it was a great place to live, but it was just so expensive and yeah, yeah. family and friends were all here and my wife was here working and it just was too tricky, so we um, made the call just to stay here, which is great because I would have missed going to all those games. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, and uh, continued on at least with the broadcasting side of things with the games. And more recently, as you mentioned earlier, that I, I moved on um, only nearly a year now. Okay. Since I, I, I took a bit of a risk. I'm not a real risk taker, but I, I took one to um, shift over to work for Port Adelaide Football yep. Club. Um, I, yeah, a job came up and it was kind of offered to me and I, I thought, well, everything happens for a reason. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they chased me, I guess. and. Yeah, 
it was a bit like uh, um, the, the girl that you never paid attention to in your class or something yeah. like that when she asks you out. And I thought, oh, okay. I hadn't thought much about doing a job like that, or at least not for the moment. Yeah. Um, at the time, I was preparing to go work for the ABC at the Commonwealth Games. And I was really excited about that. We just sort of booked accommodation and planning everything. And this suddenly just changed things for me a little bit. Okay. And um, I was just doing some you know, TV sport presenting and sitting at the desk, and it was all exciting. But I just left all of that. I thought, well, let's see where this takes me. Sure. Um, and so that's where I am now. But still keeping my, my hand in the game a little bit with um, some commentary. Still trying to have a kick with some of the other old fat guys <laughs> in the collegiate league. Yeah. And um, yeah, now family takes up a lot of my time with a little boy who's nearly two and um, another one coming in around about four weeks. Beautiful stuff, Scary mate. times, yeah, that's me. That's awesome. Um, are you able to tell us whether you're a passionate Port fan as well as being a passionate Yarn fan? I am, it's yeah. probably gonna divide people, but I don't care. Uh, <laughs> you, you gotta be, yeah. yeah. Uh, I probably didn't even ask that question completely before. I still love the Reds, you know. I'd yeah. still, I'm probably one of the harshest critics when I have to be. Um, I used to write some opinion pieces through um, the website for the book and just put them out there as blog posts and um, because I, I just want the best for the club so I was always so passionate about that. But it's love isn't it? It's love it's and yeah. it, it's the same thing for Port Adelaide for me that, yeah. that's why it kind of was a great opportunity to go to a club where you know growing up my dad was uh, on the Port Adelaide council and okay. we used to get tickets and he always had a love for the club and that's take awesome. me along so as a, a Greek immigrant to suddenly I just fall in love with this you know, Aussie yeah. game, and um, and you're not the only one. Right? Yeah. yeah, so yeah. yeah, I mean, I just loved all different sports, but I guess they're my two big loves: Port Adelaide and Adelaide United. Brilliant, mate. That's awesome. Okay, so we're going to get straight into the preview with Lucas Fonten previewing the Newcastle Jets game this Sunday. It's an away game, Lucas coming in for the Reds. Vince Lee is promoted, and uh, young AP Stamatolopoulos, who are. Uh, been a bit of talk that he might be uh, on the exit front and going to uh, the new Western United franchise. Um, but uh, perhaps more of that later. No outs for Adelaide United, unavailable was Bubba Diawara, uh, Nikola Miljusnic, uh, Lockie Brook, um, and Ben Haller are now. While we'll just mention quickly, while Lockie Brook and Miljusnic uh, might not be fit to play, they were uh, getting up to a few things during right. the week and yep. they were actually caught with Daniel Radcliffe. <laughs> um, our next gen gym and that that really did the rounds um, yeah, as yes. a story I was pretty surprised I know it's Daniel Radcliffe <laughs> but just seeing like Nicky Miljusnic <laughs> being on like you know the first story for like the Herald Sun and all these big sport editorials yeah. was pretty intriguing um, and I wonder how those things come about I know do they, they approach you and go hey uh, can I get a photo yeah, yeah. strange story probably normally on the other end of it so yeah. yeah it's great Daniel Radcliffe is in town to film a movie though um uh, so yeah, Ben Halloran also unavailable. Ins for Newcastle, Glenn Moss promoted, Nigel Bogard, we know very well about him, um, a lot about him. He's promoted, Ben Kantrowski likewise, Dimi Petrados is a big one, um, and Daniel Georgievsky, the former victory player. Out for the Jets is Pat Langloy, Jake Adelson and Noah James. Unavailable is Jason Hoffman, who's been having a really good season, um, as well as Ronald Vargas, who's uh, quite a weapon for the Jets and will be missing. Good news for us, facts and stats. So we've beaten them 17 times historically. They've beaten us 13 times and there's been 13 draws. We've scored 58 goals against them and against us, they've scored 44. Just some key off the stats. Newcastle Jets have scored first, uh, sorry, Newcastle Jets have scored five first half goals in their last three A-League games, more than they had scored in their 18 league games prior, which is four. Adelaide United are undefeated in their last three A-League games against the Newcastle Jets. We've won two of those and drawn one, a period across which there have been a total of 12 goals scored. Of course, that, uh, that rule snatch and grab um, not too long ago. Um, Highlighting those stats, uh, the Jets have made 18 total shots, including blocks per game when playing at home this A-League season, more than any other team. Lucas, getting straight into the key components. So, big one to start off with. Newcastle will have a dilemma on their hands. They don't seem to have a great amount of depth this season, which is probably down to not having recruited particularly well um, and having overestimated their own stocks after making last season's grand final. They now find themselves in with a sniff of making sixth spot if they can string together a run of wins, 
But they've also got the ACL to now compete in, where it looks like they could have a decent opportunity to get out of the group and make something of their season. They did have to play off to make the group stages last week, and on Tuesday just gone, they were hammered away to um, Kashima 4-1. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, some fantastic memories uh, surrounding that club for us. Now, all the talk is that they'll be up for this game Sunday because of the fact that they're only eight points off of catching us. Uh, but will they secretly be prioritizing Asia? Um, I don't know. I guess after last week seeing the young boys they put out there against Melbourne City, I mean, they got the result, which they is fantastic. Did, yeah. So that was a massive win for them. Um, but given the five ins that they've got, that's a pretty strong team for them. Um, I, I reckon Newcastle would love to have had Roy Donovan earlier on in the season. That Absolutely. suspension, you know. Yeah. How have they missed him this year? Killed him. Um, and Andrew Naboot. So to lose both of those guys, I know Naboot missed at the end of last season, but... Um, with Petrados, like those three were just such a great front line. And um, so they basically lost two of those and they didn't quite replace them. Sure. Um, and O'Donovan is still finding goals now. Yeah. You know? So if, if they, they probably would like the season to be two or three rounds longer. Yeah. Because they, they'll mount a pretty strong chase now. It, part of me kept keeps expecting the Phoenix to slip. Just At to some point. Yeah. Um, but to, you know, Rudin's credit, doing a fantastic job over there. But yeah. um I don't know that they'll particularly prioritise Asia. I think they're pretty realistic in the, the, the chances, knowing the depth that they've got. Um, they, will, they probably want to stay in Asia, though. Yeah. That's the other thing. So they probably want to push hard and try to get to finals. Um, that's that's a key thing for them because it's they're a small club. Um, they're Owned really by a, Ch a Chinese businessman, too. That's yeah. the other thing. I mean, they, 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 want to, yeah, they want to be seen in Asia. They need to win some games because mm -hmm. for them, you know, that's that's an important thing. And if they're they're going to be very visible in that Asian market, which is pretty lucrative for a lot of clubs, um, if well, not so much in Australia yet, but should be. Yeah. Um, but that, yeah, the more they're seen, the better it will be for them. But I still think Eddie Merrick is a pretty smart guy, and I think he'll be um, pretty focused on on that chase now. The most people aren't expecting them to get anywhere, so the pressure's pretty much off in terms of the A League. Sure. But I think, what is it, six points or something, the difference? Eight points. Eight points. You did mention that. Yeah. Eight points. So it's not completely insurmountable, mm -hmm. but... Um, no. it, it is only three games That's at right. the end of the day, That's and there's right. still seven to go. So, I mean, yeah. you know, it is possible, as it's you possible. say. It's possible. And I think, like I said, with the pressure off, this is when teams start to perform. Yeah. They start to get results. And, you know, a couple of wins in a row, a City or a, or a Wellington or even Adelaide United slips a couple of times. Let's look at it this way. The Reds haven't exactly been playing fantastic no, football for the last three, three or four yeah. games. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that, you know, it's pretty easy to, to lose. And the Reds lost to the Wanderers last week pretty poorly. And it's very easy to do again. So they're going to have to be switched on because the sure. Jets, um, they'll come out firing with some big inclusions. You mentioned Hoffman there. He is, he's, he's their real swing man. You know, yeah, yeah. Plays as a fullback, and then you chuck him up forward, and he gets a goal he's, here as well. He still so, performs, yeah. It's yeah, he's not pretty versatile. Not a big name, but yeah. fantastic, fantastic player for them. And um, Vargas, a lot of creativity and spark there. So um, Petrados is in, you know, go somewhere. To Hasn't had his best there. season, has he? No, and you know he's more capable of a lot more than he's shown. This he needs year. he needs the players around him a bit yeah. more as well. So yeah, um, we'll wait and see. But yeah, it's it's an interesting game. Interesting game to see how. Adelaide responds and what the Jets can do after four games in 12 days they've had. It's Definitely. been a busy time. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned the fact that uh, they beat Newcastle 3-1 uh, in their most recent result and we obviously had quite a downer against the Wanderers last Saturday night yeah. at Cooper Stadium, losing 3-1 yeah. ourselves. Um, do you want to quickly just touch on that? Yeah. What, went, what went wrong there? Just, oh, it just Bad day at the office. Bad day at the office, but it's it's been a, a pattern for the Reds where they've been starting pretty slow. Yeah. Particularly at home, home form's been real bad, home, hasn't it? Yeah, and like the crowd, it's been the crowd's been disappointing. But when they, you know, when they lifted that game yeah. against Brisbane, you know, it was just yeah. completely something different. And it, I think the crowd carried the team home. Um, this time around, I know there was a initially there was a little bit of expectation from me and maybe some others around me that maybe they could do it again, but mm -hmm. that would have been had to you know do it the third time in, in yeah. three games at home, and you, you can't put yourself in those positions and Correct. expect to, to keep somehow grinding out a win. Mm. Um, so for mine, I think the selection's a little bit interesting mm. because I think that having Blackwood up there um, and uh, Jordy Thomason um, up forward, they're, they're two very similar players. They, they both could be alike, and it's hard to. Yeah. Distinguished between them. I thought Blackwood actually had a fantastic game. Thomason didn't quite um, get into it at all, but he 
he persisted with him and kept him on the whole time. Mm. I thought, you, you've got to make a change. I mean, um, he, he wasn't working. Push Blackwood further forward. Don't put him out on the wing where he was a bit ineffective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, get get Army and so on. Get, you know, get, put constant doppel. Like, just make yeah, yeah. the changes maybe a bit sooner because you could see things weren't working. Sure. And he put Goodwin in the middle. And again, he wasn't getting in the game a lot. Show glimpses when he was. And it's just, yeah, it's just about finding the right balance. The trick is... For them at the moment, the issue is those those outs. The Haller yeah. and, and Nikola Belusnich was just starting some great form. Yeah, yeah. He started slowly in the season, obviously yeah. an injury, and and I thought Kiddo when he turns it on. Him. But yeah. yeah, as soon as they, you know, if they play the right way, which is they need to be qu- quicker in transition. Mm-hmm. Suddenly they're dwelling on the ball a lot, taking too long to build up, um, and yeah, it, something I noticed when it's a. Uh, you say yes and Vinny Leo playing together, they're both deep, they kind of get it a bit in each other's way. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, you say yes, he's a bit out of the game. Mm. As soon as he played with Constantopoulos in front of him, suddenly you say yes is the everywhere man. He's yeah, everywhere, yeah. he's onto everything, he's putting balls through, he's, he's stopping everything, and um, he really dictates the play. And he's one of only three players in the whole competition that have played every minute yeah. of every game. It's a phenomenal season. record. Yeah. So um, he's so important to the side, but you limit him. Boland had a, a couple of great, you know, cameos here and there since coming back from injury, but sometimes you have that. As soon as you're back, you're excited, you you know, you're full of adrenaline and then you go a bit flat. He was probably the reason we game. beat Brisbane, to be honest. Exactly. So that's, that's a so, great example that you've just outlined. Yeah, so I'm hoping that was his sort of downer. He, was mm. his, he, he wasn't brilliant. Um, they didn't link up too well and, and they just were so slow in, in moving it. And they've got such pace and such attacking threats on the wings mm. and they just don't get the ball to them quick enough which you know the, the other team just gets back quickly yeah fans in numbers and we saw how organized the wanderers were and correct um for a know, team that's had a ridiculous amount of defensive indiscipline exactly uh, and they were pretty on the ball so it's, it's clear that teams have started to work out laid out yeah. you know if we can get back quick flood the defense make sure they don't get space um behind the, the fullbacks then then they're pretty sweet so yeah, let's hope that Kurtz and his team are noticing that because um, he's not getting Halloran and Milicic back anytime soon. Yeah. Um, whether he persists with the, the Blackwood and Thomason combination up front, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Um, I don't know what your other options are, whether you put Constantopoulos in and play with the yeah. three that way. We'll have to, again, wait and see, but um, that's why they get paid the big bucks. And yeah, we'll just correct, mate. That's and it. have opinions. Wonderful <laughs> analysis, though. Um, so I just wanted to ask, uh, and you have touched on this a little bit, um, end product last week was yep. uh, very poor. Um, it has been sort of all season um, at times. Is it time curves through Carlo Armiento and Aura Moroni into the side as both seem to deliver a ball into the box quite decently? Um, we were badly hindered by this last weekend, like we just touched on. Yeah, look, um, in Moroni's case, it's a hard one because he's a, he's a fan favorite, he's one of my favorites. Um, but Strang has been working really well on that, yeah. and, and that full back row. He's aggressive, he's strong, um, he gets up and back, and he, he doesn't put a bad ball in generally. Um, mm-hmm. He doesn't mind taking a player on and darting into that box, and when you do that, you're gonna, one or two things is gonna happen. You're gonna, well, there's probably a third option too, but you're gonna get past the player and he's gonna have to foul you, you get a penalty, um, you're gonna get a, you know, whip a ball across the box. It's a dangerous spot to be in when you're right on the byline and you've got, you know, players running in and attacking it. Um, well, I guess the third thing, which is probably more likely in a lot of Adelaide's cases, is ball goes flying over the top and misses everybody and the crowd sits down again. But yeah. um, <laughs> So it's a hard one to see how Moroni fits, given strain has actually been pretty good. Yeah. Um, but Moroni does deliver a good ball. It's just, it's a tricky one. Um, probably, you know, like you mentioned in the transitions, uh, you want strain on the park in those moments. That's but, right. Um, in terms of so end, key end, products, end products, yeah, Moroni can, can whip a decent ball Swap. in. So I think that's the case for him starting that yeah. a lot of people um, who love Michael Moroni want to see him play. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, as you've as you've outlined, Ryan Strain his uh, engine is phenomenal. Yeah, and if you can just work on his ability to cross the ball when he's under pressure, yeah, um, you feel like he's definitely got uh, quite a ceiling indeed. Um, anyhow, we move along. So uh, Scott Galloway just yeah want to discuss him quickly. It's been a revelation yeah. on left back. Um, one of my He's becoming one of my favourite players, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I'm a real huge fan of this guy, and what's remarkable is that uh, he actually 
pretty much instigated his own trial to mm. come and play here. So yep. we didn't headhunt him or anything like that. He got um, told to move on by Wellington. Mm. And uh, it could have been a case of, you know, into the NPL somewhere for him. But yep. here, here he is uh, excelling in the A-League for Adelaide United. shows, I mean, Adelaide took Vinny Lear in a similar way as yeah. well. It's, um, I'll, be, I'll be honest, and I was one of the probably harshest critics of the decision by Adelaide to sign Galloway. Yep. Because and I probably, probably weren't... Yeah, probably the wasn't ones. a low. Yeah. But it, uh, to me, I thought, well, in my mind, he was a right back. He's mm. right footed, plays right back. And I thought, we've got Strain and Maroney there fighting it out. Correct. Yes, we lost Elbridge. He was another right back. But I thought, the left side is where we're lacking. Mm. And I thought, what are they doing? Um, but that guy, you wouldn't, if you looked at him and you saw the way he played, you wouldn't know that he was right footed. Yeah. He scored a, he cut in and scored a bomb on his right foot. Yeah, like the season. Remember, but, yeah. But um, he's left footed. Uh, his left foot is, is actually pretty decent. Yeah, yeah, uh, for, for the sure. most part, his crosses are dangerous. Mm. He links up well with Goodwin on that left side and, and Kiddo, probably to a lesser extent, but they're, yeah. they're working on it. Um, so, yeah, he's impressed me so much with how much energy he plays with. He's up and back. and. You know, the Cassios of the world would probably be pretty proud to see a guy like that. Absolutely. Um, he's not the, the, the niggle Scott Jamison type left yeah, yeah, back, but yeah. he's he's just a workhorse and um, he'd probably be the first guy on the team sheet every week for, for Mike and Kurtz at the moment. Don't think you're wrong, mate. Actually, um, sorry, second. How can I forget you say yes? Sorry. Yeah. Mate. That's a given. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, so uh, Kurz was rather punitive in his post-game presser last weekend. Quick quote, he said, maybe they're little details, but in the end, these details bring the game in the right direction, and today we were a bit lazy. Um, does this give us, I mean, this is this is uncharacteristic of him, um, does this give us any more reason to speculate that he may be departing at the end of the season? It's hard. So for mine, I used to love going to the press conferences before and after the games because, you know, as a punter, generally, you read the article or you, mm. you see a quick clip on TV and you get 15 seconds of it. You don't get the full context sure. at all. So, um, it could be out of context. It could be out of yeah. context. But, but um, there's, two, there's two reasons that coaches say things. And it's a, number one is a, a message to the faithful, you know, be, you know, keep the faith or, or whatever it is. It's a, or a message to the league. The other one is to, to the players, yeah. motivating players. Um, so... Yeah, I think he's brutally honest for the mm-hmm. most part, and I think that could be partly because he's not overly confident with his English, even though I think it's it's brilliant yeah, it's um, very good. for a, for a guy with his second language. Um, but but yeah, I think his his honesty is good, and I, I think they were lazy. There were there were moments there mm. they were knocking down the door, they were, they were banging on the door. But the problem was they they get so excited pushing forward, chasing goals that they were a bit lapsed with their defending. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and we saw what happened against Melbourne City the other week as mm. well. You know, it's such a Poor, poor moment for them. So yeah. uh, I think, yeah, it's it's a tricky one because you get into this part of the season where um, the top six is mostly made up. Yeah, um, the Jets would like to differ with that, I guess. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so it's hard to keep motivated to get this point in the season. And I think they're almost thinking, oh, let's just get the finals. Let's get to this mm-hmm. now. But there's still too many games to be thinking like that. So sure. Hopefully they've just reached the, a little pit there, and they're they're going to come up now. And yeah, mm-hmm. that probably is just his messaging is really more just to, to make sure that his players know that he's well aware that if they went up to scratch um, things need to change and um, as I said before I think clubs are starting to work out yeah, and Lady United little, so um, little, little few details I hope he's got about. something up his sleeve as well um, I just found a really interesting almost like a little bit of a role reversal um, mm. from the last time the Wanderers visited where Babel uh, was really laying into the players and yeah. Kurz um, was you know quite defensive yeah. um, when asked about you know we couldn't win the game on the day this is a tall draw mm. um, at Cooper Stadium but you know we gave everything you know that kind of rhetoric um, opposite this time around but Babel coming out saying you know how proud he was of the effort after half time conceding on the on the uh, edge of half time and mm. then uh, obviously Kurz saying what he did anyway um, there's, there's another narrative in that too because Babel was under a lot of pressure because his team wasn't getting results. And now it's kind of the club's come out and said, we'll back you, you've got another yeah. season kind of thing here. Whereas Kurtz is sitting there going, well, where's my contract? I don't, I don't know what's going on here. So it was a, it, that was yeah, another sort of mm. strange sort of part of that narrative in that, that yeah, it really did flip. Interesting times. Um, some news today. Uh, and it's a fun little question I've managed to uh, tune out from from this topic, but uh, news today that our kit supplier Macron Australia will possibly be entering liquidation. This was put out by the Red Army's Robbie Anderson. Um, if we were to partner with someone new next season, 
Who would that be for you ideally? So we've only ever seen since the league, uh, since the agreement ceased with Reebok, mm. that um, universally every club had to have Reebok as the kit supplier. That's right. We've only ever seen sort of minnow so kind of Italian brands. Yeah, since yeah. that one. Yeah. <laughs> so we've seen the Kappas, Macrons. We even had Legia um, right. for a bit, um, and Araya as well. So um, we seem to love the the sort of lesser Italian brands. Mm -hmm. um, who would you love to see Adelaide United get kitted out by? Um, I think I've always been a bit of an Adidas man. Okay, yeah. Adidas I'm the same. You're going to throw some stuff my way. But, um, but yeah, look, oh, I think it's more, more and more likely we're going to see someone like a Puma or something like that. Okay. Who, um, yeah. For mine, they, yeah, they get in because um, they offer clubs maybe slightly cheaper rates, yes. yeah, yeah. Um, better deals, longer term. Um, but yeah, there's some sort Probably of power to have in the <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me because um, yeah, the club doesn't have a lot of dollars to play with a lot yeah, of the time. Yeah, but sure, I would love to see what Chinese brands are out there throwing throwing uh, kits around. Given the the links that our owner has with um, Qingdao and yeah. Red Lions, and yeah. so I'd love to see who their supplier is. Um, a few others, but he's also got links and clubs, you know, in Europe and things like that. So, yeah. who knows? Who knows? But uh, that's an interesting thought, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've just got a few questions I want to read out. These are fan questions, Lucas. Sure. So, um, your fans or uh, fans of the show? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have any fans. Nat Harrison, though, um, a uh, name we're probably familiar with. Yeah. Uh, she asks. It's a pretty detailed question. Mm -hmm. um, given the recent sacking of the coach of our national women's football team, Alan Stadig, obviously, for those that don't know and the underperformance of the Socceroos, I assume she's referring to the Asian Cup. Um, while seeing the improvement of other countries like Japan over the years, what suggestions does Lucas have on how Australian football, in terms of its player skill level and the coaching, and the officials and the general go governance level, can improve? Jeez, I reckon we can improve all of those. Jeez, <laughs> Nat, thanks for that one. Yeah. Yeah, just um, throw them out of the bus for that one. <laughs> but look, it's a, it's a fascinating question, and it's one of these things that like we just don't seem to ever have an answer with. Yeah. Um, I think FFA is is fighting a losing battle a lot of a lot of the time for funding. Um, they need to be smarter in in, in the, who they make friends with because um, government funding is going to be key. Um, we read a report only was it yesterday? I think it came out a couple of days ago anyway about yeah, um, the us. the need for yeah finances, not enough pitches, mm. facilities are poor, just the under resourcing, and you, you see how much you know that our football clubs are taxed and um, and compared to what you say AFL or NRL and some of those other ones, and you think well like they've already got a leg up. They've got huge broadcasting deals. They've got government funding. A lot of money goes into stadia and other things. Um, and you just think, why can't we make that work in our game? Mm. So I think the first thing is gonna be money and facilities. There needs to be a really strong dedication to the, to the junior football setup. I don't think they've quite got it right with the disbanding of the, the AIS you know, um, setup because so many great players go through there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that was a big one. Yeah, it's, it's tricky to know whether you know, it's gonna take a generation or what, but um, things clearly aren't working. I guess the Socceroos were unlucky a little bit, you know, when you think about who their potentially most world-class players are, when you've got Moy, probably Lecky, you're probably two only, and, and Matt Ryan as well, yeah. Azani, you know, he's, he's still yeah. a little bit short of getting there yet, but yeah, he still yeah. was, you know, he Very could potentially be there. Yeah. So some key players are missing um, mm. at key points and just never quite got themselves going. So I see that. Um, Stadic, look, I, I'm still intrigued by that story in particular, but, um, I think we, yeah, we've got to move on. We've got a great, we've got a fantastic female team. The Matildas are amazing. Yeah. Um, problem will be is to making sure that they keep, because you've got once in a generation players and Sam Kerr and, and, and friends in there as well, and to make sure that those, those young players keep coming through and keep shining like that. That's the next test, whether it's their you know, golden generation or not. Um, strong leadership is needed, and I just feel like there needs to be some of those girls moving on, becoming coaches, and and taking the, the next generations through. And that's that's a key thing. I um, actually did a story, one of my last stories at the ABC about FFSA was running female only coaching courses. Okay, right, yeah, I do remember because that. Because they were saying that, you know, sometimes they're intimidated to go to mm. the, the mixed class. Of course. Yeah. One or two of them in a class and they're frightened to speak up. So um, that kind of stuff is fantastic, but it's just, there's probably too few people um, pushing for for too much, I guess, and um, if we get a few more people on board, get the right people on board, um, 
you know, hopefully we can get there, but I don't, I don't have the answers now. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't have the answers, but um, just on more me. people like you. That's what they need. basically. Yeah. That's a good call. Um, and Nat is on the show next week. Oh, fantastic. fantastic. Um, I do wonder what your thoughts are just regarding Stagic as a media practitioner, because mm. that story blew up bigger than I've seen any other um, story related to Australian football mm. in as long as I can remember. And it yep. just happened to be one about, or starting to feel like an FFA own goal. Yep. I mean, how frustrating is that? Like, uh, you know, they just can't get anything right at the moment. Yeah. That's the problem for them. And yeah. I, I don't know who gives them the advice. So for mine, looking at it now, working in a, a football club in terms of AFL, and yeah. um, the way that you kind of operate is that, you know, my, my view on this was that when they announced it, there's some underlying factor. The reason they're not giving us any reasons behind it um, and they're li- living a really vague sort of, you know, toxic culture and blah, yeah, blah, blah. really yeah. vague, but um, I thought was they were protecting him. And it was an agreement that by either party that, or both parties, that they wouldn't disclose why, in the best interest of, I guess, statute going forward, making mm-hmm. sure that he can get jobs and, and also the FFA in terms of finding who comes in next and not tarnishing the, any of the players or anything like mm-hmm. that. So I thought that's, that's probably what they're doing. Problem is that we want to know more and the questions are getting asked. And then things change for me when Stagic himself come out and says, yeah, I still don't know the reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This kind of thing. So that was intriguing for me. And I can't understand why they're being so vague on it. Mm. I think in, in the world of sport and the world of whatever it is, politics or whatever, the longer you leave it, the worse it gets and the, the more for discontent. Sure. Yeah. If you just get it out, knock it on the head, people appreciate it, they respect it. As long as the reasons are valid, don't come out here and give us something that you, you just doesn't make sense. We're going to have another Rennie Coolen saga, you know, go to yeah. court. So um, nobody wants that. It just drags both, you know, individual and organisation through the mud. It doesn't need to get like that. But um, yeah, I, I probably would have advised them differently on how they, they sort of handle that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, a wonderfully articulated opinion. The uh, the second question is from Sean Castelline. Oh, yes. If I pronounce that correctly, he says, uh, and you've touched on this, but he's probably seeking a bit of clarification. Uh, he says, has Lucas started writing about the second decade? <laughs> no. <laughs> Put it that way, no. Um, if you want to help, Sean, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't know if you're back in Australia. I think he's overseas at the okay, moment. Um, right. he was in, I think he was in China, actually, last I heard, but um, doing good things overseas. Um, but, yeah, look, it's, um, I don't know, maybe not yet. There's plenty to write about already. But, yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, maybe when it gets a bit closer. Okay. I'll get you on board to help me out. <laughs> oh, mate, I'll be there <laughs> with bells on. Don't worry. Um, now, just before we start wrapping up, uh, our key player versus theirs and your final prediction. Ah, uh, right. Key player for mine. For Adelaide first. Yeah. Jeez, oh, it's a tricky one. I think yeah. we're going to get a bit of, bit of love. So many people have said Goodwin. Pretty yeah, much 90% I mean, of people who have sat where you're sitting have said Goodwin. He got lambasted a bit last week. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to take the pressure off him a little yeah. bit. Um, he's been good. He started the season like House on Fire and he probably hasn't yeah. sort of kept that, which mm-hmm. is tricky. It's hard to do for us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Um, but the best players do that. So, you know, he, he, he's got the highest expectations of anyone on his Correct. performance. So he'd want to do it. Um, Probably going to stick with a safe option though and go back with the uh, SA is the captain. Because <laughs> yeah. just when he's on, yeah, he just lifts well, the whole team. Yeah. Um, yeah, so he's just so important. And um, as long as he's marshalling the troops, I guess I feel like um, the Reds will probably be okay. Um, well, for them, probably O'Donovan, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, he, he can make something out of nothing a lot of the time. He, mm-hmm. he doesn't need too many opportunities, which is the kind of player that Adelaide would love. And um, there was talk about him coming earlier in the year, but he, yeah, he's the kind of guy that most teams need. Um, gets under the opposition skin, but he, he just he backs it up by putting the ball in the back of the net. So sure. he's probably the key for them because I, I don't know who else scores. I just don't see yeah, it's, contenders we're really, jumping out for them. So yeah, they're really sharing the goals. Um, yeah, so it's he, he's key. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't know. Do, would you rather a guy kick twenty goals and a couple that chip in here and there, or would you? Rather, I guess, a, a good spread. Yeah. I'm um, divided. I, I like the idea of a good spread because it means that if one guy's having a bad day, you know, if Goodwin's quiet... Yeah, it can rely on others. Kiddo steps up or yeah. whoever else, you know, yeah. puts one in the back of the net. So, I mean, I like that balance, but, um, yeah, to, to know that you can almost rely on him to put one in... Sure. You, you He's a good finisher. I mean, yeah. it speaks for itself. Exactly right. Um, your final prediction, what's going to happen? Final prediction, I think Adelaide will probably get the job done. 
it's not going to be a, an overly light nice story. As they haven't um, been. Yeah, look, there's a bit of concern for me about Adelaide's defence because I know um, Jakobsen took a nasty, like, almost a cork against yeah, the side. Elsie didn't look great either. Elsie did not look good, and there's a bit of doubt on him. Yeah, yeah he's, he's top of his foot, I reckon yeah. it is. Um, almost the ankle, and it's it's a hard one, but they don't have too many other defensive No, of course, there's Moroni, who's not even a centre-back. Really. Exactly, or, or yeah. Lear or something like yeah. that. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's like a late change in, in okay. that space, but yeah. Um, I don't know who, who who plays in that role and who, who can um, basically stop O'Donovan and Petrados if he gets going. So, um, but yeah, I think it, you know maybe a two-one probably repeat would show. I think that'd make it the first time Adelaide's been able to yeah. you know, have, have consecutive wins over there yeah. against Newcastle for about four years or something okay, like that. Wow. So, yeah. Um, don't quote me on that. <laughs> Actually, I did write a note something along those lines. Let's say it sounds right. Longer. I've written 2005. Jeez. So there you go. That's a long time. Heard it here first. Years. So if it happens, it's, yeah, first time they've been able to win twice on the road to Newcastle would be pretty special. Brilliant. Um, I just want to mention uh, that the NPL team starts their season as well this weekend. They're away to Raiders at Raiders. Uh, so we wish them all the best. And I just want to mention that when uh, the A-League finishes, we will be doing an NPL show. So look out for that. Um, now, just before we uh, wrap, Lucas, um, do you want to just tell us where we can find a link to purchasing this fantastic book, Decade United? Yeah, sure. Um, the website is uh, decadeunited.com. So it's pretty simple. Yeah. Um, easy to remember. Um, Beyond that, it is available in a few sort of bookshops, so you can you can hit up the best bookshops. Best, best bookshops, um, yeah, Dimmicks in the city, yep. Um, also Glenelg and uh, Dylan's out at Norwood on the parade. Fantastic shop there as well. Um, and the other one is actually not even a bookshop, but Soccer Locker. I don't know if you've heard that place. I have. Find it. Yeah, it's Find it. Yeah, it's it's a brilliant place. Corner Grange Road and Crittenden sort of little shop okay. there, and they've got so much stuff. But that includes the book, so wonderful. If you want to see it firsthand, you know, before you buy, it's there. And beyond that, there is a bit of a special that um, on the website, so you basically get it for half price or less. Um, and I'll chuck in the delivery. So um, yeah, and I think you can even. Um, Preview the first hundred pages or something like that. Yeah, um, there's somewhere. A, yeah, oh, there's like an e-reader which yeah. is on the website as well. You yeah. can have a look at um, a couple of chapters there to just whet the appetite. But um, yeah, it's a it is a fantastic book there. if if you're a fan that supports a team 100% week in week out, or if you're just someone that's interested in football and occasionally go to games. <laughs> it's worth having uh, just on a coffee table to pick up here and there. That's it. Um, just look at the pictures. Don't even need to read it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, just want to mention lastly, if any fans out there have anything they'd like to donate uh, for the studio in terms of merchandise or any kind of sentimental items relating to Adelaide United, please contact the page. Other than that, Lucas, it has been a pleasure getting you in the studio. Uh, we did pen you down a couple of months back, but uh, you are an extremely busy man. <laughs> Sorry about that. And, uh, and uh, obviously we appreciate you coming in because, uh, you know, time is not... Uh, your best friend. No. So um, uh, it's been absolutely amazing having you on and uh, just hearing you talk about your whole experience as a fan, everything that you've done in regards to not only putting the book out, but uh, your your experience in the ABC, um, even doing work experience before that with the club and, and everyone you've spoken to along the way and everything that uh, you've contributed to for this club and for the supporters to indulge in in regards to content. Um, we have a lot to thank you for. Um, hopefully we see you again uh, in the very near future. It'd be great. Thanks again for having me and yeah, that's some very kind words. All right, mate. It's been a pleasure. See you Cheers. again.